So I think what makes me resilient is I just love the process. I actually love life. I love life and understand that sadness is a part of being human, that feeling weak is a part of being human. I don't think we're afraid of just failure. I, I think we're afraid that maybe if we succeed, we still won't be that person. And so early on, I had zero affirmation. And so I had to decide who do I want to be for me? Like, who do I want to look in the mirror and decide this is the person I can live with? And, and so ironically, I made some choices that were, I don't even understand them, to be honest with you. I didn't believe in God, really. I didn't have a faith. I didn't believe in Jesus for certain. And I decided. When it comes to like your perspective on things and, you know, setbacks you're faced in your life, would you say you've had the tendency to be able to bounce back quickly? And if so, how did you sort of go about doing that? Yeah, I am like eerily resilient. I don't have a lot of attributes, so I'm going to hold on to this one well. Like, you know, <laughs> no. no one looked at me as a kid going, wow, what a talent. <laughs> it was more like, what are you going to do? So I never had the curse of talent. And, you know, so, but I, 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 but I do have this unexpected gift of resilience. And I, and I think a huge part of it is that highly talented people are, are oftentimes very unresilient because they do not develop the internal structures that support that talent. And so the talent allows them to circumvent the internal process of creating the structures that give you strength. And so I knew at an early age, if I was going to survive, I had to learn how to get up. He goes, I'm a guy that's going to go down. I'm not the guy that doesn't fail. I fail a lot. I, I, you know, I'm not the guy that avoids the rubble. I'm under the rubble. So like, you know, and so I had to learn early on, if I'm going to have a story or telling, I got to get up. I got to stand back up when I fall. I got to, you know, learn how to recreate myself after I've had a failure. And so I've had massive failures in my life, but I'm pretty hard to stop. I knew success was very unlikely, but I love that 1% of opportunity. And so I think what makes me resilient is I just love the process. I actually love life. I love life and understand that sadness is a part of being human, that feeling weak is a part of being human. Becoming aware of your imperfection is a part of maturity. I think people think, oh, you can only love life when everything's going well. No. Like you can love life when, when life is a, is a train wreck. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> yeah. even more because there's so much to gain at that point. When you feel like you're at your peak or, you know, prime, it's like maybe there'll be a drop off and that's also scary as well. But there's, there's something to say, I think, about being under the rubble and knowing that there's only, there's only like throwing rocks away to, to come and like and getting back up. It's so refreshing though to hear you talk about failure because... Just at, even as like, a, you know, someone growing up and looking up to people like yourself who've had lots of success and trying to understand the way you see life, I think failure sort of gets left out of the conversation sometimes because we like to, I guess, stay up on the, on the pedestal that people can put us on when it comes to, you know, having these wins. So to hear you talk about those setbacks and I guess the rough edges around, the, around it, is it's super refreshing. I think that probably one of the toughest things for me personally when it comes to failure, and I'm sure it's for other people as well listening, is that initial shame of, does this mean that I'm like bad or like I'm not good enough? How do you tackle those thoughts that come on top of the rubble? So you've almost got double the rubble hitting you. <laughs> wow. Let's let that sit. Let's let that sit for a second. That is, that's powerful. We use this very intense psychological analysis on some of the business people that I coach and mentor and things like that. And, and we use it at Mosaic with leaders as well. And one of the interesting thing is something called an image management score. And it's on a scale of one to 99. How much of your energy do you use to create a persona that other people see that is you? And how, how much of your energy do you not spend any effort on that? And I would say if I've graphed, let's just say a hundred people, I've graphed perhaps a lot more, but a hundred, 96 of them would be 90 and above from 90 to 99. And ironically, the most successful people I know have an image management score so high that it drives them to be successful because they need to be loved. They need to be adored. They need to be worshiped. 
and they need to have fans. My, my image management score is the high number of 11. <laughs> and, and so I, I had the great advantage of having no affirmation growing up. No one told me I was special. <laughs> In fact, if anything, I remember in adulthood, my, my mom is 84, she's amazing, but she told me probably 10 years ago, I'm so sorry. And I said, for what? She goes, I'm so sorry for the, the way I raised you, the way I treated you. She goes, my father told me, I'm gonna say everything negative about you, so you hate me, so you live your life disproving me. <laughs> so she goes, that's the strategy I took on with you. <laughs> and uh, I just told you everything that was wrong with you, everything you were not going to be, so that you would be so angry that you would live your life to prove me wrong. But the opposite actually happened because I realized if I live my life to prove them wrong, they're controlling my life. And I'm an anarchist at the core of my being. I, no one's gonna control my life, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I'm just not gonna let someone's opinion control my life. And so early on, I had zero affirmation. And so I had to decide who do I wanna be for me? Like, who do I want to look in the mirror and decide this is the person I can live with? And, and so ironically, well, I, I made some choices that were, I don't even understand them, to be honest with you. I didn't believe in God, really. I didn't have a faith. I didn't believe in Jesus for certain. And I decided, I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to be an honest person, no matter what it costs me. I didn't even know why. I just thought, this is like a powerful universal principle. Because everyone I knew was basically lied all the time. I told myself, I'm going to be different and I want to be unique. So I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> so I, I, I actually took on virtues because I wanted to be different than everyone I knew. And, and then I thought, I'm going to be the kindest person people have ever met. Like, that's, that's how I'm going to use power. I'm going to use power by being kind. And so I chose all these counterintuitive virtues and I just made them the measure of who I was. And it wasn't because of anyone else. It wasn't because of religion. It wasn't because of fear of like eternal punishment, you know, it wasn't anything. It was just, I'd like to be like a true human. And I'd like to be the human that I would love to find in the world somewhere. And it gave me hope in humanity. I, I know it sounds kind of weird because I thought, hey, if I can be kind, then it means there are kind humans in the world because I know I'm not the only one. So if I can be loving, I know there are loving human beings in the world because I'm not going to be the only loving human being. So choosing to be a certain kind of person gave me hope in humanity because anything I could become, then someone else was already that and probably better. And then all of a sudden I crash into Jesus and I go, oh, wow, this is everything I wished I could be, but I'm not. Because I knew I, I couldn't live up to my own standards. I, I didn't need the Ten Commandments to make me feel like dirt. I, I already knew. Like, even when I loved certain virtues, I couldn't live up to them. And, and so, in this sense, I, I was always deeply disappointed in myself. Y you know? And, and so, the shame for me was internal. It was never from someone else. It was, I can't be what I think humans should be. And, and, and so when, for me, faith came around two, I think, huge things was like this release from my own unrealistic expectations of myself to help someone say, hey, I just, I just love you as you are. I, I just love you as a mess. It's great that you want to be better, <laughs> you know, and I just love you broke. And, and I thought, wow, somebody would just like love me broken. Well, that was pretty compelling for me. And then the other half of it was, and I can make you whole. You know, every, everything you long to become, I can take you there. And I can make you that from the inside out so you're not working to it, you're working from it. And those were two compelling things. And so even if there wasn't a God, I was going to say, I'm in. One of the big ones is fear. I, I, I think that we're, well, one, we're, we're afraid that if we try, we can't become who we long to be. And so it's like, I'd rather think I could be that and never try, but say, I could have been that, <laughs> you know, I could have been a champion, you know, I, I just, ne I just never had the chance or I, I never took the risk. And so we, we have this ideal of who we could be. And if we don't try, we don't damage the ideal. So I think, I don't think we're afraid of just 
failure. I, I think we're afraid that maybe if we succeed, we still won't be that person. And, and so I, I think the beautiful thing is when you realize the beauty is in the process. There is no destination. We're just afraid. You know, we're, we're, we're afraid that we can't do it or become that. And we're also afraid that we aren't that. And, you know, maybe we discover we're, we're less than we thought. And, and I think the, the ironic thing is we end up discovering we're more than we knew.